Hi there, welcome to short vodcast looking at superpower relations. This is going to be a short one looking at key topic one in a basic overview, not a lot of detail. So simple to begin with, let's have a look at the two sides. We've got the United States, sometimes seen as the West and the Soviet Union, the USSR in the East. Uh, the West, the United States principally is capitalist and democratic. Capitalist means that people are allowed to make their own money. They've got their own property. It's about individual wealth. Communism is about shared wealth. There's no private ownership. The state, the, the, the country, owns everything. Now, in terms of politics, uh, the West is democratic, which means you choose your leader, whereas the in the Soviet Union, there are elections, but the Communist Party is the only party you can vote for, and therefore they, they always win. So you've got these two very, very different political and economic uh, sides. So let's get through this then. Let's get into key topic one. The first thing we're going to have a look at is the Grand Alliance. This is where the United States, the UK and the Soviet Union had a common enemy, uh, Nazism. They were fighting in World War Two. Now, in the first conference, there's not a lot of tension. Uh, there's a little bit, but there's not a great deal. That's because they've got this common enemy, Hitler, and they need to defeat him. Stalin is a little bit angry. Why? Because the British and the Americans haven't launched an invasion of Europe yet, and he feels like he's doing all the fighting. But for the most part, they're agreeing on an awful lot. They agree on the boundaries of where Poland would be. Uh, they're going to basically move, shift it a little bit westwards. They also agree to set up a United Nations. And the UK and the US agreed that they would invade Europe the following year. So mo mostly in agreement. Then you get to the Yalta Conference. By 1945, by February 1945, Germany is pretty much defeated. And although it isn't yet, they're looking at the post-war. So the tensions begin to... Uh, bubble a little bit here. So what did they agree? Well, when Germany was defeated, it would be reduced in size. It would get some land given, to, uh, it would get some land taken off it to make Poland a bit, uh, a bit bigger because they're moving Poland westwards and it's going to have to pay reparations. They don't agree on the actual amount, but they agree on that. They talk about how Europe will be rebuilt along the lines of the Atlantic Charter, which is that they'd have democratic elections. They agree the United Nations have been set up, talked about that in Tehran, and the Soviet Union said that it would invade Japan once the war was over. And they said that Poland would be in the Soviet sphere of influence, but it would be democratic. Now, Stalin meant it's democratic, i.e. it's communist. The West, the UK and America thought democratic meant democratic. Tensions increase further when you get to the Potsdam Conference. Because by now, uh, basically, the war in Europe is won. So Germany is to reduce in size. It's going to be divided into four zones and it's going to pay reparations. Berlin is going to divide into four zones and the Soviet Union is going to get some reparations from the West because the eastern side of Germany isn't as rich. Now, what are the consequences of these conferences? Well, Whilst Britain and America and the Soviet Union were able to work together to defeat Germany, by the end of the Grand Alliance, we'd see mistrust, mutual fear and control of Eastern Europe. Mistrust because by Potsdam, you've got two new, uh, two new leaders. The one you have to remember is Truman. He's an anti-communist. He doesn't like Stalin. He's replaced the American president, FDR, and he basically threatens Stalin with the fact he's got an atomic bomb see this picture here. So differences were beginning to emerge over what kind of post-war Europe you were going to see. So then we move on to the next focus, the increasing tensions. And that mistrust, that early tension we see manifests itself, it expands. In 1946, Winston Churchill makes his Iron Curtain speech where he says that the Soviet control of Eastern Europe has basically made, created an Iron Curtain. And what he means is that the Soviet Union, fearing the Americans, has taken control of all these countries in this map down here on the bottom left. 
the, these pink ones here. And what they're doing, and the Soviets are saying, we're scared, we're creating this buffer zone between us and the West. The West see this and think that they're trying to expand communism. It's not helped when the Americans in Moscow write a telegram back to their, uh, their people in Washington saying that the Soviet Union is out to expand communism. But because of that mutual mistrust that you saw last time in the last slide, the Russian ambassador in Washington writes back to Moscow and says the same kind of thing that the Americans are preparing for a war against the Soviet Union. So you've got this mutual mistrust, this mutual fear. Now, because of what's been going on, there's this fear of, it, uh, of communist expansion in the West. And when communist fighters are tr uh, fighting in a civil war in Greece and the British can no longer afford it, Truman instigates the Truman Doctrine. And as a consequence of that, the Marshall Plan. Uh, the Truman Doctrine says he's going to contain communism. He's not going to allow it to spread any further than it already is. And that the Marshall Plan will help do that by giving Western countries $13 billion of aid to rebuild so that the countries don't feel under threat of communism because you know poverty breeds communism. Now, as a result of this, the Soviet Union launched uh, two organizations, Cominform and Comicon. Uh, Common Form is a Communist Information Bureau, and it's basically designed to instill control over Eastern European countries that the Soviets have under their sphere of influence. So these areas here in pink on this map, and also to link with communist parties in Western Europe, like Italy and France, etc. Comic Con is basically the Soviet version of the Marshall Plan. They don't have the same amount of money nowhere near as much but what they do have is they have control of their economies so they make those countries a lot more um more, a lot more reliant on each other and it's this control of the, what you call the satellite states okay so what impact did this uh, soviet occupation of eastern europe have on superpower relations well up to now the USA sees the Soviet takeover of Eastern Europe as a betrayal of the agreements that have been made. They sort of saw it as evidence of Soviet expansion, and therefore the Americans are determined to contain it and stop it from spreading, hence why you get the Truman Doctrine and the Marshall Aid. And the Soviet Union would say they need to do that because they're scared that if they don't do this, that the, the West is out to get them. Okay, so next stage linked in with this we then get really our first kind of flashpoint which is the berlin crisis of 1948-49 the west through martial aid has, are basically rebuilding their sectors of germany and the american and the british sectors create bisonia and later on you get the french sector trisonia what they do then is they then think about developing a new currency Stalin sees this as a threat. He thinks, oh my God, they're out to get me. I need to do something. So as a result, he targets Berlin because Berlin is in the eastern half of Germany, but it's got four zones like Germany itself. So he blockades Germ uh, Berlin. He blockades the roads, the canals and the railways. And he's aiming to basically get the West out. He doesn't want this vibrant western half of Berlin when the east and East Germany is really kind of just been suffering under Soviet occupation. As a result of this, so as a consequence of the Berlin blockade, and I'll just, I'm just draw a pen, into, as a result of that, you get the Berlin airlift, where the, the British, the Americans, the French fly lots of supplies into West Berlin. And they do this to basically say to the Russians, we will not be pushed around. And it lasts it lasts over 1948 into 1949. It lasts about 11 months. And although there are problems, i.e., you know, food is short, um, resources are short in Berlin, the, the blockade eventually crumbles and Stalin backs down. As a result of this, you get the formation of, so you can see the equal signs, you get the formation of West Germany here and East Germany here both in 1949, so you get this formal division of Germany, and 
as a consequence, you also see the development of NATO, the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, which is this collective organization of security in the West, where all the countries in Western Europe and North America, United States and Canada, basically join forces and say, we will protect one another from a Soviet attack. Uh, the Soviets see this and think, oh my God, it's a threat against us. So they then ally, create an alliance between the Soviet Union and all the Eastern countries uh, in Eastern Europe uh, that are communist. And you can see them all down here. And they create the Warsaw Pact. So you've got these two camps of military forces, uh, each seeing each other as the threat. The final topic in key topic one is the Hungarian uprising of 1956. And the big event there is that in 1953, Stalin dies. Now, Stalin's been this huge leader in the Soviet Union for such a long time that it takes a while for a new leader to kind of come through. So in 1956, you see the new leader, Nikita Khrushchev, give a secret speech to lots of Soviet politicians where he denounces Stalin and says that what some of Stalin did was really, really wrong. Now, this creates this belief that the, you can reform the control of Eastern Europe. And there are protests, first in Poland, but Poland says it's not going to leave the Warsaw Pact, key. And then in Hungary. Now, in Hungary, there was a really, really nasty man called Rikosi, who had got rid of opposition. He'd been what was known as Stalin's best pupil. He was desperate to um, keep control like Stalin would do. Well, eventually he gets he gets kicked out. And because of these protests in Hungary at the problems there, the poverty, um, the oppression. So there are protests. Khrushchev brings in a guy called Naj, this guy here. Now, Imre Naj is a reformer. Khrushchev thinks that that will, that will uh, help solve the situation. It doesn't because Naj gets really patriotic and says, not only do I want reforms like free elections and freedom of the press, uh, I also want I also want to be able to leave the Warsaw Pact and for Hungary to become a neutral country, i.e. leave the Soviet sphere of influence. That's when there is a Soviet invasion of Hungary uh, in 1956. Uh, following these protests, the Hungarians think the Americans will go in and help them because they've been told this or they've been told versions of this before, but it's not true. The Americans say, look, you're in the Soviet sphere of influence. We're, we're containing communism, but we're not going to start World War Three over this. So as a consequence of this, it made Khrushchev think the Americans were quite weak. He thought then as well, he will be able to push the Americans elsewhere, like in Berlin. And it really solidified control over Eastern Europe. So I know it's been a slightly longer, but we've gone through key topic one in just over 13 minutes. Any questions, please feel free to comment. There are podcasts that go into this in more depth. And thank you for listening.